Yes, thank you. Welcome back. I hope you are refreshed from the short break. And uh, thanks again uh, very much to Shamin and Zünke who came up with uh, all of this here. And I think it's great. Um, the other day I had a short conversation uh, with Alex about this, uh, what, what seems to be some, some of the exciting uh, feats of this um, area is that you have this complex mixture of things that you need in order to understand what happens. Yes, you have things like uh, economics, game theory especially, you have like uh, applied cryptography, you have other uh, areas of applied computer science and so on and so on and so on. And you need, uh, for instance, also domain experts, which is wholly different thing than again, like for instance, from uh, research you need uh, insights of how scholarly publishing works, you need uh, to know about how academic institutions and research and learning works and so on. So it's, it's fascinating and every time you, you learn new stuff. So what I'm about to tell you here is something that, um, to start with, will get slightly meta towards the end because I gave a variation of that talk two weeks ago at the web conference in Lyon and it turned out that at the same session we had Tim Berners-Lee there uh, the inventor of the World Wide Web, and we had a very interesting um, discussion on how blockchain might help or might not help with uh, uh, very basic problems of scholarly publishing and opening science. So, toward the end, I will uh, tell you a little bit about the outcomes of this little discussion, which I find fascinating. And uh, but let's let's go right into um, the the uh, matter at hand. Uh, first, let me give you, because most of uh, you, I, I don't know, you don't know me, let me give a little bit of a background where I'm coming from, yes? Um, I'm not a researcher, but I'm an academic librarian, so I work for uh, different uh, research libraries since now already 14 years or so. Around five years ago, I funded a new uh, group in the research and development department of uh, TIB, which is the German National Library of Science and Technology. Uh, it's called the Open Science Lab. And um, what we are doing, just to give you two examples, I want to be very quick here, is um, for once um, we, we promote uh, Vivo, which is an approach to um, uh, current research information systems. So if you are working at a research institution that wants to set up a database where you can easily find out about all of the research outcomes of the researchers at your institute, and you are currently pondering, like thousands of other institutes all around the world, about subscribing to, uh, for instance, Elsevier Pure, which is a current research and information system, Think again, instead switch to the linked open data approach, which is Vivo, which is much better. This is not a topic for today, but just to mention the kind of stuff I'm usually into. And uh, to give another example, uh, have, have a look maybe at, at the URL given there, book.fosteropenscience.eu. Uh, we set up a book sprint. Uh, by which I mean we, we invited 15 researchers from all over Europe who are more or less specialized on giving um, a training in data science and open science and so on. And we, we wrote a, a handbook for, doing, for people doing uh, um, open science training. Yes. And uh, have a look at this as well. And so you see my point is not, not uh, maybe here and then doing actual research, yes, but I'm more from the open, uh, from the research infrastructure side of things. So, and I was very delighted to hear this welcoming note today from an actual head of a library here. Very good, very good point to, to invite him over. And um, yeah, that's where I'm coming from. So um, one, the, the, the actual thing that I want to talk about uh, today is a research assessment. This is only, as you know, one aspect of uh, what um, this whole uh, research infrastructure, actual doing research is about. But as you already know from Ingo's talk this morning, this is crucial, yes. Because you have 
first of all, you have research assessment virtually everywhere. Yes, you have this most atomic element of giving peer review, but then you have the higher level functions of committees who uh, all of the time decide about things like hiring, like tenure, promotion, funding, prizes, fellowships, and so on and so on and so on. Mostly built more or less on this most atomic uh, thing like the, uh, of the peer review. And as you know, uh, this is only one aspect, one point of view on, on the research system, on the system of academia. But it's a crucial one because we have a huge systemic issue here, yes. And, and uh, Ingo introduced us to, to, to this very briefly, yes. The problem could be stated in that way that I say, okay, um, these committees that, that I mentioned just, um, they um, mostly rely on proxies to, re to assess research quality. And one, 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 of, one of the most well-known uh, proxies is, of course, the journal impact factor. So instead of looking into the actual research, they rely on some indicator that tells us about the perceived, some perceived quality of a venue to publish that research. And this is really hugely broken and a huge issue. Yes. And, and if you uh, take away only one practical thing that you could do right now from my talk, let's check back with your research institution if you are from academia if you already signed up to the uh, San Francisco Declaration of Open Research Assessment. Yes, because this is a great way to involve your senior researchers in this discussion and, 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 and uh, bring this to their, um, to, to, to their attention that there is this issue. And I could go on with this, but I won't. This is just uh, to, to open this, um, to, to, yeah, to uh, think about this. And uh, at the same time, this is not only a policy issue. It is a great policy issue, but it's not only on that level an issue. So, uh, why or how? My thesis here is that we failed to give researchers agency and transparency about research assessment. And as somebody who is involved in the area of crypto-economics, you maybe can already tell by this head of my slide that I view it very much to the, to the lens of crypto economics. Yes, I would say the challenge is to give researchers agency, by which I mean direct control about their identity, their assets, which is the actual research outcome, and the interactions between them which is, when we talk about research, not a currency or, or a monetary credit, but research assessment. This is, this is the issue with, uh, with research assessment uh, through the lens of crypto economics. So, let's have a look where we are with this, with, uh, if, how, how we failed so far to give researchers proper agency. One thing that came to mind immediately, that comes to mind immediately, is ResearchGate. Who, buddy, of you has a ResearchGate profile? Okay, that's nearly 50%, maybe more. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's not very surprising given the huge success of ResearchGate. Yeah, there are literally millions of researchers there. And on the surface, it's very nice. It's, uh, I, I, I just, the other day, I had a talk uh, about this with Sönke, where we recognize that this is another iteration of something we have gone through uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, when we both, but of course many other people as well, promoted open science and science 2.0 and stuff like that. And uh, these were one of the champions uh, that came out of this revolution, yes? And, and on the surface, it's very nice what, they, what you have there as a researcher. Because you are in the driver's seat, yes? You can decide, okay, I, I, uh, I want to um, state some attribution that I gave to a work of research. I want to uh, give credit to other people's work. I will show off my network. 
I will um, uh, see what other people tell about my work or our common area in my timeline. This is really valuable and it puts the researchers in the driver's seat, as I would say. But now, what's the problem with this approach? There is this one company in Berlin called the ResearchGate GmbH and they own all of the data. It's literally in their terms of services that every time you give up this valuable piece of information, um, it's like a present to them and they are allowed to do whatever they want out of it. Yes. So have a look, for instance, at the most recent agreement between Springer Nature and ResearchGate, which essentially says whenever you put up a paper there and Springer Nature thinks for some reason that copyright does not allow you to, to upload it there because it belongs to them somehow, they can pull the trigger and, and uh, so, so and, and this already happens like millions of times. So people, people a paper just vanish from ResearchGate. Um, this is usual there. Or see, for instance, just as another example, the ResearchGate score, yes, yes, which resembles this one-dimensional way of doing research as assessment as we are used to it from uh, the age of, of journal impact factors and so on. It's very one-dimensional because there's only one company in control yes, and they set this up. It's utter, utter bullshit. Ask anybody who's into bibliometrics, they will tell you why. I won't go further into this, but I state it is utter bullshit and uh, it doesn't help in any way. And this is just to mention one, two of the examples of the problems with this model. Yes. And then have a look at another model and that is ORCID. Who of you in this room has an ORCID identifier? Ah, oh, that's great. I love you. You are a great audience. <laughs> so you are very literate researchers who know what, what, what is going on and how to behave. <laughs> but um, the thing with, with ORCID is it's, it's the best what we have in the area of, to, of the, to disambiguate between researchers and their names and to attribute them proper in one place. So it's one C centralized open database of um, all the attributions that we need. Again, the idea is fine and in many ways it's a counter model to what I told what I showed you just before, research gate, right? Because it's all open and it's not controlled by one entity, but it's a controlled, it's, it's, it's a very properly governed by a consortium of large publishers, libraries and so on. So, but there's still another problem here with this approach, and that is that uh, ORCID is by its nature largely an aggregator of um, uh, research metadata, so to say, research information which is produced and controlled by big publishers. So they have a huge systemic issue with metadata quality because nobody is incentivized or even allowed to directly control what, what is there because it's all through the proxy of data which is produced and controlled by big publishers. So again, another systemic problem here. Have a look at, the, uh, at, at my article at the London School of Economics Impact blog if you want to learn more about this kind of issues. Now, uh, ah, okay. If you think about it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I need to be more quick here. But, but this is a problem of statement, and maybe already the most important slide of my talk. Um, look at it. We have an issue with data ownership here, yes. Or to rephrase it, um, a problem with uh, the agency of both senders and recipients. And what I want to point out very quickly now is that in another related area, which is educational certificates and higher education, uh, people already two or three years ago came up with a solution to this kind of problem. And that is called block certs, and it's a blockchain-backed educational certificate, where you, as a recipient of some assessment of, of your work, ask uh, somebody on the blockchain, which is your research institution, your teacher, whatever, 
to certify you or to, to assess to 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 to, um, yeah, so to to certify something to you, and then it's completely yours. Yes, it is immutable. It stays there, and you decide what to do with it, which is a great thing. Which is really a sh showcase example of what blockchain is about, was what it has in store. And I will very I will not go further into this because of lack of time, but uh, a very important point, the technical concept which is discussed in this area is self-sovereign identity. But as Shamin pointed out, and this is hugely important, is it's essentially about individuals and their personal data. This is what is at stake here. And um, what we have is a decentralized identifier as an option for self-sovereign identity. And um, also all of this, I would say, what we have as blockchain is still experimental and somewhat hyped. This is a, a, a very hot candidate for solving some of the problems with data ownership. Because uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, claims on such systems are uh, cheap, but they are not for free. And this is a uh, huge solution for um, um, economic sustainability of a system that is really not owned by one particular party that is involved in this, yes, as you know. This is so special about this. And the other thing is it is virtually publicly owned and you and only you are the sender, uh, 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 you are the party who, who is responsible for what is said, what, what, what is done in your name on, on that system. And um, so this is uh, more or less uh, my last slide. Um, the idea would be to let every research, and, and this is hardly new or hardly original. We already have, as you know, a number of startups who are actually working on this. I just want to have a common denominator or the, the bring up the concept of what this is about. Yes. And this is that, that you let every researcher let make statements directly without any detours, without having to rely on any particular architecture or server or so. And um, by the way, you fix the incentive, the broken incentive structure of assessment and metadata quality by disintermediating, by disintermediating this pro process. And uh, by the way, you also level the playing field for business model innovation, yes, which was called back in the 90s when Tim Berners-Lee came up with the World Wide Web permissionless innovation. Because you have a system <coughs> then where nobody would have privileged access to this valuable scholarly metadata, but it's a common good. And uh, just very briefly, but I will really end in a minute or less. Um, so so one, 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 one of the interesting uh, things uh, that, that we have in this discussion with, uh, um, with uh, people like uh, Tim Berners-Lee about blockchain in this area is that um, they assume um, that um, our protocols, and as you know, blockchain is all about protocols, not, not, not delivering these islands of, of, of uh, vertical solutions, but uh, protocols that are open to everybody and which everybody can use. That uh, this layer, level of protocols um, is thought to be uh, separated from the level of economies and incentives. Yeah. Very interesting. Think about it. It's maybe one of the things that is holding people back or, or is, is the, on, on the level of understanding things. Uh, an issue. And another thing is uh, this issue of uh, Ethereum or things like that coming out of fashion. Also very interesting. But I don't I need more time for that. And then if, if you want to have a closer look at this article where some of the ideas from these slides, slides are further expanded. And yes, thank you. Maybe we can allow at least one question or so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, you started off by talking about linked data. Uh, what have you come across in terms of the intersection between linked data and blockchain? 
just very briefly, the, the overlap is huge, and we will uh, depend. Or, uh, we will. <coughs> we are not even started yet. Yet with doing linked open data right. Yes, we will need it be, because this is another layer. And alone at this web conference in Lyon, there were two entire tracks only about the overlap between linked data and distributed ledger. That tells you something. For instance, j just to give one quick example, have a look at uh, John Domingue and what he is doing with educational certificates uh, at the Open University in the UK. Yes, They have all of the semantic layer of the Mozilla Open Badges, where you refer to a learner's e-portfolio and so on, with all the nice semantic stuff. But then you have this new level of crypto economics um, so, so it's, it's not mutually exclusive, but it's really, uh, it yeah, belongs to each other. Sorry. Oh, um, it was more about uh, in the future yeah. when um, researchers do run their own data, their open school, um, how will it be funded? The, the nice thing about um, <coughs> blockchain, if you think about it, is, is that you uh, don't pay by uh, having your institution paying a hefty subscription fee to some huge uh, thing, like a publisher. Neither do you pay with your personal data by using services for free from some big company, but instead you pay a very modest fee to, pay, uh, to place the actual information about you and what you have done on a blockchain. Okay. This is the whole difference. Yeah. This fee may just consist of a tokenized piece of resource that you have and that you abundantly have. So for instance, you could say, okay, I have uh, one gigabyte of bandwidth that I hardly use and 10 gigabytes of storage that I, that I actually not use on my notebook. I, I give that to the network and in exchange, I, I, give, uh, I uh, be, uh, get that token that allows me to, to, to uh, do proper uh, uh, research data management attribution to my research and so on. Good, excellent. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do you enjoy it? I like it. It's an untalk at an unconference. Okay, and you, you introduce yourself. Yeah? You. Okay, excellent. Hello. Uh, so my name is Leon Kodashak. I'm coming from. Uh, well, basically two, two teams, one is uh, with Codex, we are a <coughs> fresh startup in the field of uh, crypto, whatever, and uh, I'm also a, a professor at the University of Maribor, which is not far from here, 250 kilometers, a uh, neighboring country, and you get here very fast if there are no traffic jams on the highway for Vienna, like today. And uh, so I would very much like to thank first for the opportunity to the organizers and we exchange some emails and telegram stuff. And uh, it's really nice to see uh, that there is an uh, open community building up around these topics, which for science are quite important. Uh, and also I would like to thank all the previous speakers to, to give a nice intro into the field so I can skip a few slides. Um, and uh, they, I would like to make just two points actually. Uh, first, I would like to um, really connect blockchain and science and see that blockchain technologies are really the, the, the perfect match to solve some of the problems we already identified this morning. And second is that give you a brief idea of what we do. Um, so why are blockchain and science a perfect match. If you look at the uh, sort of the idea of the blockchain, uh, you have uh, three types of decentralization going on in this area. First is architectural, so there are no failing points. The next is political, there are no uh, agents uh, centralized who make decisions. And the third is logic. So there is one common degree state. If you, if you transfer this to science, it's basically the same thing. And science is actually the only social process that we know of so far that actually leads to a broad share of consensus. And this consensus is formed around empirical statements that are true in scientific sense, of course. 
Now, not everything is rosy as we discovered before, especially in publications, incentives, uh, ranking, or whatever. You know. uh, so something is seriously wrong with science, and uh, uh, not just uh, that people are trying to patent mathematics lately, but also other stuff. Uh, the process of publishing, reviewing, uh, citation cartas, uh, you need. So also, we like to forget in science. So uh, you have papers that have been retracted, but they are more cited after they've been retracted than before. So basically, this is a, a good example that this stuff with publishing doesn't really work. So if a, if a paper is flawed and then retracted, and nobody knows that, and everybody's still citing this paper, so well, you're citing something that is inherently wrong. And it, this still goes on. You can look up that paper, has no citations, and still cited in 2018. Well, it's like everything is okay. So you need something that would serve as a chain of, uh, let's say, events, history, that it's not forgettable. Okay, so the basic unit <coughs> that we use for communication in scholar, scholarship or academia is basically the paper. Yeah. It usually is pretty obnoxious to read this stuff because it's written in some strange language, <coughs> bordered into English but not quite, uh, full of symbols, graphicons, nobody understands, because it's a jargon. So there are two nice papers in Atlantic, so if it's really obsolete, they were both perfectly, and also Paul Romer wrote uh, What's the Future of Scientific Paper? They are more, more into that we need to have open code, open data with the paper so we can actually check what was calculated in there. Uh, but of course, this is not the only answer. Uh, what we think, and which is our core idea of our solution, Incidentally, if you're here tomorrow, we will have a demonstration. We can talk to uh, our, our, you know, our CEO sitting there and some other guys who will be coming here. And uh, uh, we can show you a few demos and stuff how it's working. So the basic is that uh, the, the publication itself has to change its nature. So two of the authors are actually sitting here of this uh, idea published that the publication should be dynamic and collaborative. Uh, so if you condense this message into a few keywords, it's basically a uh, future paper should be dynamic, so it should change all the time. It should allow remixing, so you can take something from one paper, so the core idea, mix it with the other, put it in another paper, it should be collaborative. Okay, so three pillars of the future paper, but do we have the technology to do that? To sure we have it. The idea is that uh, you can look at the paper as a, as a contract first. A so smart contract because we are on blockchain conference and basically our technology that we are working on is of course the Ethereum. And, uh, uh, but before even it's a smart contract, if you think clearly, it's actually a contract. And it's a contract between the authors who has to agree that what they will publish is actually true, if they are, of course, true scholars, otherwise they are frauds, they are nice also like that, so but you cannot fight that, that's impossible. Um, so uh, there should be a contract between them, it's not a legal contract, a law contract, it's a social contract, actually. And the research paper is actually a contract between this group of authors and the community. So that they, what they express there is something new. They bring something new to the table in science and they stand and they take a stake for that. Uh, so how to do that? Uh, in uh, a few coding slides, if you don't mind, so that uh, we get some nice pictures also. Uh, you can think of a paper that it's coded into something as a finite state machine. So a paper has a few states and a few transitions between these states. If these are carefully thought through, you can actually automize this stuff. You can actually come up with a paper that you can transfer this finite state machine into a smart contract, basically in state. 
and you can draw a transition graph. So if in this small example, for instance, as an author starts with an uh, active paper, so it publishes, it introduces it, for instance, into our platform, and then he waits for some community response. If there is no community response, well, obviously it's not a good paper. If there is some community uh, response, either negative or positive, this state, for instance, transferred into recognized state. So the paper is now recognized by the community, and it, go, and it could go through technical report. So there will be guys who are interested in this field, and they will read, write a positive or critical or whatever report, and they will take also the stake in, in, in writing the report, naming by uniquely by being uniquely right, identified. So no more anonymous reviews in which you can hide be behind your unknown identity and you can write whatever you like, you can even steal ideas uh, and then in a few weeks publish the same paper or stuff like that, we all know this stuff. Okay, so from the recognized paper you can have positive technical reviews, negative technical reviews, you can end up in an in endorsed state or you can end up in a locked state. But that's not the end actually, even if your paper is locked for some time, if you still get positive reactions, you can unlock it and start the process again. So the paper actually never dies. Uh, of course, this is a very simple graph. Uh, what is missing here is actually an economic system that drives this stuff. So the incentives, why would I do that? So obviously, I need to take some stake if I publish a paper. So I need to put some of my tokens someplace else and if I if I'll be successful in publishing, I will get some more tokens back in the end. If I try to publish some rubbish, I will lose these tokens. Uh, so I, I won't get try again. Okay. So uh, there should be a clear economic incentive not to overpopulate the uh, overpopulate the scientific publishing field. If you believe in your ideas, you will fight for it. You will take a stake. You will take a chance that you will lose something, but in the end, overall, if you're really true, if you're really a scientist, you will be winning at the end. Uh, okay, some idea of how to implement that. Um, basically, it's uh, this type of uh, stuff is already running, uh, so you can code this state and transitions into simple solidity functions. And since this is a smart contract, it also doesn't die. And uh, if you now take a few steps into the future, you have a blockchain system, platform, whatever, and you have myriad of contracts going on in the blockchain. So, but basically what you have, you have an autonomous entity that lives on the blockchain and other papers can interact. So other contracts can interact. How? For instance, by citing. So each time you cite something, you are interacting with a smart contract. You either uh, make a transaction to that contract, you make a call, you make a message, or whatever. So, uh, in a landscape of different entities that live on a blockchain, uh, a paper yeah, as a smart contract would be something between distributed or decentralized application and decentralized autonomous organization. And if you take a few contracts together, basically you have a journal. If you have a, a many contracts together, you have many journals. You know, but they are just for one time, in one particular moment of time, there's a journal when there's an interesting topic. Otherwise, there's no journal. And the journal will be just a selection or just ad hoc collection of papers in the same field that have very narrow focus. So all the people that who will read these journals will be interested in that papers. Today, there are basically no journals. I mean, as a practicing scientist, who actually reads journals? I don't. Uh, maybe I'm in minority, but I never read journals. I read papers. And I don't care where these papers came from. If they are not on the internet, if they are not on archive or preprint service somewhere, I will not read them anyway. And uh, if many of, this, uh, many of scholars will do that, uh, well, there will be no journals anyway. So, but that doesn't solve the problem of publishing because there's always a problem of trust. And trust and incentive is what is basic to blockchain technologies and what is changing the way people think about human and social systems. 
So basically, this is our uh, starting site. You can visit it today, tomorrow, show it uh, to your friends, spread the word. Uh, ask us anything. We to cooperate with other projects in this field. There are many projects in this field. Very exciting. And we'd like to contribute to this community actively. Uh, basically, what you can do, you can claim. <laughs> you can claim a paper that is already in our database. Uh, you have to install a MetaMask wallet. Uh, for now, we are running this on a, on a test uh, blockchain, not, not public yet, but it will be soon. So you can see how the transactions are when you claim something. You can also write a review. You can cite whatever. So there's also the interaction between the entities that live on the blockchain. Uh, and uh, your article is on the blockchain. It, it has a hash. There's my Ethereum address there. If somebody is interested to donating something, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, what we like to do with this project is actually we like to uh, help those uh, researchers who are unable to publish today to express their ideas and to even to review. Why? Because they don't have access to this system. They are probably living uh, in a not so well off economy. They don't probably, they have very difficult access to internet. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, these solutions are the step in this direction because the talent in the world today is much greater than obviously now. So we have half of the world that doesn't have internet access at all. So now imagine in a few years when these numbers will go up, we will have really all talent at our disposal to uh, advance science. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, perfect. Thanks. I'd really like to talk, so um, uh, forgive me if I try and ask the most awkward question I can think of. Uh, so, um, we looked at like, the history of publishing, uh, universities, the incentives, and yeah. how they corrupt uh, good aspirations and good meaning. We looked just recently at maybe ResearchGate, which kind of is great, but also had a kind it's of Facebook-like yeah. yeah. business model. It's the business model that's the problem. Uh, I frequently try to collaborate with projects like yourselves, mm -hmm. uh, but you have a certain legal structure and your own incentive structure in terms of finance, sure. which can make that difficult to collaborate with you. So obviously, as far as I can see, you will make money from the actual smart contract itself. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I could just fork that smart contract and do a, an equivalent version of that. In fact, I would like to add those smart contracts to an open access journal. We're working on it. Yeah. Have you looked at your um, own legal structure and the way you're financing it and examined how that might steer you in a good direction or a bad direction? And for instance, in particular, why would you structure yourselves as, I don't know how you're structuring yourselves, as a private company rather than a co op? Yeah, yeah, well, um, uh, I mean, the, the structure, being structured as a company has many advantages uh, because you are your own boss, actually. Uh, you can uh, have access to different types of funding and uh, other stuff. So you are more responsible even if you are in a small group and uh, run as a, as a startup. In, in, as, or, or as a community, but anyway, our, our idea is to, to have a public blockchain, blockchain in the end. So everybody could publish, everybody could uh, review, everybody can read everything. Everybody can set up their own identity on the platform. There's no problem with that. The only thing is that you can actually earn, as an individual, you can earn by reviewing and by publishing, which is now you are non-compensating for this stuff. I'm not compensated if I'm reviewing papers for a Elsevier journal, and I don't do that. Even if I get an invitation, I decline it, actually, because I would not like to uh, support this kind of free work of scientists, uh, even if it's uh, as, a, as a community service. But I'm not serving the community. I'm serving a huge publisher 
who claims the copyright afterwards. So how are you different from that? Uh, because you are you are incentivized. For instance, how do you earn your money? Uh, in, in a company, yeah. a piece of transaction, piece of every transaction that happens in the blockchain. But you as an author, you earn much more. For instance, you have a couple of tokens issued and you would like to publish a paper. You put a paper on the blockchain, if it's successfully published, you get a few tokens, tokens more back. If you write a review, if this review is positively judged by the community, it can be a negative review, but it should be uh, viewed from the community as something contributing positively to the community. So you actually found a flaw in the paper or something like that. Again, you, are, you, are, you will be getting some reward in terms of crypto economic uh, uh, incentives. Okay, so it's, it's actually uh, a network effect. If you have enough people, the system works. If you have two people, it doesn't work. And that's the only thing. Yeah, I think... Uh, how does this happen with the promotion if you're not a recognized scientific uh, scientist? Well, no, 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 if you're still, if you're starting out, why would you do that? Uh, if, uh, sorry, yes, okay, the incentives, no one really cares if they get paid a little bit, really, in academia, because their goal is to get promotions. The yeah, yeah, I understand. But this is this is the, the the problem with every everything you do in this field. Because if this incentives doesn't change at, in the academy, you cannot do anything actually. So, but uh, established researchers, professors who have gone through the path, they are probably not interested in this stuff. You know, I am, but. Uh, because I, I don't think the system is fair. Because I can see young people leaving academia for the wrong reasons. Uh, but as in any other social incentives or systems, things doesn't happen overnight. So if you would uh, look at the papers from, I think, uh, 95 or something, there was a famous paper that, uh, w what is this World Wide Web? For instance, in Newsweek, this won't work. You know. uh, what can I do there? I, can, I, I cannot do anything there. So, so basically, you are at this, exactly the same spot. You have even huge economists and uh, uh, even computer scientists who are uh, against crypto economics, crypto field, or whatever. So, why? Because it's definitely. Uh, reshaping the field. So if you give the incentive to the individual, many things can happen, actually. So, but it's not easy. You know. But if you don't have any other option, if you're outside of academia and you want to publish, you want to do something, you want to review, you cannot review nothing. Nobody will invite you to review something. But you can review here by yourself. You can write a review and publish it. If, if you've not done anything, before. And of course, if you're doing positive things, your rating, your recognition in the community will rise. Maybe somebody will look at you. Maybe somebody influential will invite you. So very quickly, one thing you might want to do is get people, technical experts, to review journal articles. Because most of them are wrong. Yeah. Because the reviewers don't know what they're talking about. They might be about what they're really talking about. Yeah. That would actually be useful. Yeah, yeah. You can clean all papers and review them. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's the idea. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. Yeah. 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 Marius from Science Food to talk about, well, the Python set, right? You can just like introduce yourself yeah. Yeah, if you want. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me first introduce our founders. Uh, Vlad Günther. He has a broad knowledge in IT finance and consulting. He has worked for major companies like Bosch and Microsoft. And Alex Kiritsa, he's also my brother. Um, he's a physicist. Um, he will start very soon his PhD in molecular dynamic simulation at the University of Vienna. And I'm Marius. Um, I'm, I hold a bachelor and master's degree 
from the University of Vienna and my background is in uh, experimental particle and nuclear physics. Okay, so I'll be talking about, uh, we will propose a new way of scientific conduct and how can we incentivize the community with blockchain. So I will go firstly uh, through the problems very briefly. Uh, so the number one I would put, it's limited access to research output. Research papers are not free. And do we need open access is the question. Well, I would say yes, because in order to create research, we need access to information. What is creativity? It's taking known elements and put them together in original ways. Satoshi didn't invent Bitcoin. The elements were there, he just put them together. I have a friend, he wanted to be a grandmaster in chess by using the power of mind, by doing meditation. It's not a joke, it's real. But unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. If you want to be a grandmaster at chess, you need to study the games of Kasparov, Alekhin, right? In a similar way, if you want to be a great researcher, you need to study academic research papers. And in order to do that, you need to have access to them. And yes, we need open access. There are no rewards for the authors or reviewers. This leads to a slow publication process, the reviewer, reviewer part. There, there have been discussed the reproducibility crisis uh, and only successful results are published. I won't insist too much on that. But uh, the last part is that uh, as a scientist you get very often stuck with something in your research. And it's important that you will have a forum where you can ask questions and get response for you. Okay, so what we are proposing at Science Root is um, a scientific ecosystem that incorporates all the functionalities required during the scientific discovery process. And this is a collaboration platform, funding platform, and a publishing framework. Okay, so I'll go through them. I'll start first with the collaboration platform. We'll have unique identities and profiles. Um, we will have an incentivized questions and answer forum. Which means if I have a question and you I have a question and you answer me, I can pay you in form of science tokens. I can tip you. This will improve the collaboration, right? Um, we will have a search engine for papers also. Okay. Another aspect that we'll integrate is a decentralized marketplace. Um, let me give you an example. What do I mean by that? If I have, let's say I have made the nanoparticles and you have the microscope, right? Uh, but I don't have the microscope. I can give you the nanoparticles and you can look at them. And by doing this without the, the third party, you can improve collaboration. Okay. Um, we will have the concept of scientific repository, which was discussed already. So what happens now? We only see the publication, right? We don't see the whole research process. We want to integrate the whole research process into the everyday life of a scientist. How will that happen? I take the data today. In the evening, I run it through the hasher. I take the hash, I put it on blockchain. The raw data will be placed in a decentralized uh, storage system. Uh, but now we don't have this decentralized storage system, so we'll use normal uh, storage system and we'll use blockchain only to timestamp to have this proof of existence right um, good it will be like a github for science where scientists can fork ideas and don't worry about knowledge there good um, we'll have a funding platform which will integrate an index of international funding system um, and opportunities uh, we'll have this idea of crowdfunding which means, if I have a great idea, and why, let's say I want to raise 10,000 euros for my microscope, and the community wants to support that, they can do that in form of signed tokens, directly without the need of a third party, and we can implement smart contracts to it. Let's say, if I want to raise 10,000 euros in one month, then if I reach the 10,000 euros, then the 10,000 euros the money goes directly for the microscope. If I don't reach in 30 days these 10,000 euros, the money goes back to the investors. OK, 
Okay, we, yeah, blockchain grants will be easier to configure and uh, distribute. Okay, uh, we'll have a rewarding mechanism for institutions. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum they work and they are decentralized because there is a is a profitable to do mining. That's the reason why they are decentralized, right? We also want to be decentralized, which means that we will especially encourage institutions to secure our network through staking coins. We will be proof of stake. And to do that, it should be profitable for them. This is the only way we can achieve decentralization. Okay. And they will get reward for staking coins. So first they have to buy them, stake them, secure our network, and they will get transaction fees. This will be also part of our business model. We will stake some coins and we will validate transactions. And we'll take a small fee out of it. Okay. Um, we'll have a publishing platform, which be, will be a framework for journals. Yes? So this is the uh, current publication system. So the author sends the article to the reviewer, the reviewer to, uh, to the editor, the editor to the reviewers. And this whole process can last more than one year. This is a problem with data security. You don't know what happens with your data during this year. What we want to do is we want to create a, a timestamp manuscript submission. So at the moment that you submit your article to these journals, it will be timestamped and you, you can prove that your data is yours. And we also would like to, to, to make a, um, a blockchainified record of every peer review. This is a way to incentivize reviewers. So basically what happens here, already established journals can come with their own business and uh, take this advantage of timestamp manuscript submission and this proof of prestige. Why is this important? We would really like to make it a, re uh, a requirement for journalists to provide their authors with this uh, proof of existence. We'd like to do that. Okay. Uh, and that, uh, the last thing we would like, after we establish the community, after we have the blockchain ready, uh, we have the scientists, everything is ready, we will, at that point, we will have our own journal. So not before. We, you, we need to build a community first. No one will publish if we start directly with the journal. And we'll be decentralized and open access. We will publish some of the negative results. Um, we will have a, a rewarding system for authors. The top cited authors will be rewarded. And a um, rewarding system for the reviewers, like paid in money. They will be paid um, depending on the number of pages that the article has. So regardless of the, if the article is published or not, the reviewer should be paid. Because he's the expert evaluator, right? Okay. Um, why is this uh, proof of existence really important? Let's assume, let's make this fun, no. Let me tell you why is it important. So, uh, if I make a breakthrough discovery, let's say I find immortality, which is not so hard to find if you think. After some age, the cells don't divide anymore as they should. If you, want, if you find the reason why, you might live a thousand years, right? This is a breakthrough discovery. And, uh, well, I wouldn't be, I would be very anxious to publish it, uh, to send it to publication right now, to be honest. I don't know what happens with the data, right? Someone else might steal it. And with this blockchain, you create this proof of existence. And this is our main objective. Okay. Um, so the milestones, to sum up what I've been talking about, you'll have this, um, um, social network. It will be like a research gate when researchers can showcase their work. We'll have this uh, funding platform with academic jobs and idea crowdfunding. And we will have a decentralized publishing framework with unique rewarding system for reviewers. Um, uh, Science Suit is not the work of a single person, it's a uh, collective work of a team and we, we would like to uh, give a special acknowledgement. And before I conclude, I would like to tell you the following thing. Um, washing hands, back in the days, washing hands was a subject of debate. 
right? Some doctors linked washing hands with spreading of disease. You know, you touch your eyes, you know, but it was a subject of debate. Uh, with the invention of a microscope where they could see the microbes, at that point we had general acceptance among the population, everybody washes hands. We want to do the same thing with blockchain in the scientific community, but for this we have to find this microscope. For Bitcoin, I think it would be uh, scalability. For us, we, I think we are already scalable and we just have to prove that uh, it works. So, thank you for your attention. charge, right? For open access you have to pay at a, an acceptable price. And who sets this acceptable price? We'll have to do some research before, right? This would be the last thing that we will do. Yeah. There is, nowadays there is this boycott, Germany against Elsevier, you know? I, I think you heard about it. And uh, I think the negotiations are not led accordingly. It's a very primitive way of negotiation. Because, think about it, um, they claim, uh, the Germans claim, that uh, open access should be uh, at an affordable price, right? And LCP <coughs> doesn't do that, and they cancel subscription fees, right? I believe it should be for free. But how do you, how do you incentivize the editorial board and the reviewers then, if it's free? You can't do this. No. <laughs> but you, you cannot put a, a, a 4,000 fee on an open access article. How could, maybe Germany could pay 4,000, but how could Poland or Hungary or Romania, yeah, I, I how know, could they publish, you know, block yeah, science if you yeah, have you know, this uh, high fees? Even if you have some research and decide what is fair price, you have your own token which, in which you pay this fee. And it's highly volatile until it huge value. And this value is more than trillion dollars, which make will which make, make it unvolatile. And once it's volatile, you have to have a mechanism to govern this fee. And this government should be done by community. And this community should also be incentivized in both two sides, those who pay for the review and those who receive participate in this government and to conclude on a fair price. So it's really complex pro problem. So it's not it's, 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 it's a problem. So regardless of the price um, what you said about the ticket, the price the price will be set uh and you link to US yeah, or Euro yeah. yeah but then so it's only then it's centralized so well you still pay the tokens but compared to the US Yes, but the uh, blockchain doesn't know anything from outside. You don't know the pricing. You know, but it can be made the price because uh, because the tokens can be very much in an exchange. Yeah, but use the key. It's it's we have liquidity for that. So that's why. Yeah. So I would suggest if, if you want to begin to use the key, there is a concept it calls smart contract or stable token, which is the price. Uh, internal cryptocurrencies, but uh, which is uh, essential. So you, you that, yeah, if you link it with some uh, fiat money, you can do this, but uh, not in that way that like USDT. USDT, it's uh, it's a problem. You yeah. say yes. <laughs> it's it's I just I just yeah. Yes. Uh, so you have the whole thing based on uh, tokens. Um, I guess you could use decentralized exchanges and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Handle volatility. But if you're staking tokens um, for the um, for validity to be able to prove, yeah. So why are you not able to then help govern the blockchain? So would the, I guess what I'm asking is would the network itself not determine what the price is, what the procedure is, like all that kind of stuff? Is that not flexible based on governance model? Well, if you really want to be decentralized, I think you cannot, you decide at the beginning and at some point you cannot decide anymore, like to change the rules. I, I guess I'm hesitant to say or to agree with that because would you not want the community 
like the global community to decide what the work is worth and then be able to change it if something say if how, something how will you change it if you have 20,000 miners I mean validators how will you change the rules you have to hard yeah, fork it's a, that, yeah, it's governance it's actually yeah, rather it's possible so hard forking and latent protocol it happens over every time and it's, it's mm -hmm. even can be made without hard fork by soft fork but there also is an issue with this cool idea and it's definitely should be done but the issue is it, that if you have a proof of stake where it's really stake so it means that those who earn owns most money will decide where the platform goes and it's a huge problem this is why we want to have uh, research institutes uh, securing our network so we could communicate with them yeah do you no? know Chandler Go? Reason. Chandler Go is the main miner in China what if he comes and buys in secondary market Calls for these tokens, and then we'll decide where the platform goes. Mm -hmm. And we'll we, and we'll introduce proof of work there to move all the my my uh, power to you, you know. Yeah, no, we can we cannot go with proof of work because yes. I don't see institutes building server farms to. No, I just mine. I just said that uh, if somebody will earn enough of stake, he will decide on the future. Blockchain. Not you. Yes, but we have so are you we have a lot of like are you keeping up fifty percent or fifty one percent? We're selling sixty percent right. of the tokens. You're selling it? Yes. Okay, so so the organization. But it's possible if someone buys all of them. <laughs> but I don't think it it's a, I mean it's either gonna be you guys or <laughs> someone else, I would say, is what it sounds like to me. Well ideally you want it decentralized, so yes. then you worry about government's problems. But then you talk about hard forking, soft forking to get the right answer. We have to have a good start, a good set of rules, and try to keep with that rules. No, I, I think it's a good idea and mm -hmm. a good presentation. It's just Thank you. this is a comp you're talking about the whole scientific ecosystem, so it's a complicated problem. Of course. Why don't you just impose an ownership cap? Then nobody can take the majority. That's a good idea. <laughs> excellent, very excellent. Good idea. excellent. And and I really love this conversation. And I want to remind you, like for tomorrow, when we like showcase all the platforms, and then we get like really into these discussions and like continue it like that. Or is that okay with you? Good, cool. So we continue with two more talks. Yeah, and yeah, but this, yeah. Hi guys, how are you doing? Still some energy left. Yay. <laughs> My name is Matthias Röder. I'm a musician by training, a musicologist. Later on, I was in the scholarly community for a few years, and now I manage the estate of one of the top selling musical artists of all time. So, my main focus is business. Today, uh, I'm very thankful to Sherman, Alfred, and Zönke for having invited me. Uh, I'll be speaking about something that I find super interesting and I'm very excited to, to be sharing you know, my ideas and then hopefully getting a lot of uh, feedback from you guys. Uh, this is an awesome community. So uh, about um, last year in December I came about this uh, concept of token curated registries. Uh, how many people in the room know of token curated registries? Okay, so it's about a third. So I'll go over the concept real quick. You can see a couple of links here. If you Google them, uh, you'll find it directly. Um, this is where this was first published, I believe. Um, the person who started this discussion was Mike Golden, and then there's also Simon de la Rouvière. They both uh, work in New York City for consensus or with consensus systems. Okay, so token curated registries are basically like lists and whatever goes on the list goes through a review process. Uh, and the review process is very simple. You apply to the list um, and then uh, people review your work and um, if they like it, you get on the list. Uh, if they don't like it, they start a voting process um, uh, where both sides put stakes in and whoever wins the votes, you know, uh, either goes on or stays off the list. So basically, you can think of it like things, for instance, like the top universities with the best ratio of student fees versus later, uh, you know, debt or something like this. And uh, universities, they want to come on the list. Uh, parents want to see that list. Um, and the people who started the list, they want the list to be high quality. 
So, um, so there are these three groups, right? The first group are, are the consumers. Those are the people who, who really want to see the list, have it well curated, have great content on it, and they don't want to waste time doing all of the research themselves. Then there are the people who want to be, um, who, who are token holders, who have a token, who have a stake in that list. Um, these are the guys who, who really have an interest, a financial incentive to, to have a high quality list. And then the, the applicants or the candidates, they, they are the ones who want to be on that list. So, so they, they, they have an incentive to be in front of that audience of customers. Um, yeah, basically this is what I just said, so I'll go through it real quick. Um, so in a token curated registry, you have application, right, review and challenge, and then voting. Those are the central mechanisms. Um, so when you apply for a TCR, you basically have to stake token of that TCR. That's, that's the, the whole point there. So you have to get that token, you, you probably buy it someplace, uh, and you have to stake that token. That sort of goes with your application. It's like an application. Um, then, once you have applied, put your application in, then all of the token holders are notified that there's a new application. And then there's a process starting. And by the way, all of this you can go on GitHub take a look at the repository, it all has been coded already, you can start using it. Um, and so basically, when you apply, there is a time that is running, and within that time period, others can review your application. So if someone thinks like, okay, this application should not be on the list, then they can challenge it. And they challenge it by also staking token. So if no one challenges your application, you go on the list and the token that you put at stake is yours. So if someone challenges, then there's a vote. And the vote is secret. And it's also weighted by uh, the token uh, holders. So if you own a lot of tokens, your vote is basically you know, uh, has more value or more, um, uh, how do you say, importance than, than if you have just started with the tokens. So whoever loses this vote will lose their tokens. So this is the basic concept of the TCR. Now, when I, when I learned about this, I thought it really interesting. And um, I was immediately thinking about a problem that, um, you know, I, I never really understood. Why, why is, is peer review such a pain? Uh, why does it take so long? Why does it incentivize the wrong people? You know, um, what about all these stupid group dynamics in, in the scientific uh, community, at least the one in musicology where I was coming from? And so, so I thought, hey, this could be a cool way to, to use that. So, in, so here are our three uh, user types again, right? This time around, the token holders are like the primary caretakers of the journal, right? They, they own the journal. I, in a way, they are a little bit like the publishers, right? Or the, the owners of the publishing house. Uh, you can think of them also as editors or publishers. So it's, you know, it's a group of people who, who are really dedicated to this journal. And they also include past authors. So this is you know, how the community of token holders gets built. The candidates are you know, those researchers wishing to publish in the journal. They would like to receive credit and recognition. They want to see their research paper on the list. And consumers are you know, also researchers, those who are interested in the topic. The topic that is, uh, for instance, Journal of Computational Musicology. You know, it doesn't exist yet, we can start it this way. Is this uh, okay so far? Yeah? Okay. Now, 
I, I basically start, I mean, had very little time to work on this and think about it and very few people to interact with. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to your feedback and discussion later on. Here are just a couple of things that I found interesting and that need uh, further discussion. So I think that if we use TCRs, we can speed up the review process a lot because basically the default is you know, looks good, looks fine, we did the basic fact-checking, the data is consistent, we can reproduce uh, the example, the research, so yeah, that's a, that's a goal, right? And this you get much faster than asking a gazillion re peer reviewers, uh, what are your opinions on this research paper? Please write a three-page response. So I think it will be faster. I think that the comments that reviewers make during the review stage, I think those are super valuable and in most peer review processes they somehow get lost. You know? They could be published here as part of the voting process. Um, I think this is a tricky one because if you are already an author of that journal, you own token of that journal, right? Now you, you put in an application for a new paper uh, it would be, you know, not correct if you, if you had the right to uh, vote in that application. So, so that's that's something to think about. So, essentially, the groups that are incentivized somehow in this peer review idea, they're going to have a lot of overlap or some overlap, and I don't know what that means for the incentives and the model. Does it still work or not? Um, token holders, um, I think. We have to have something like know your customer, right? Um, it's kind of important that the reviewers um, are known and that the token holders are known also. So if I apply to a list, I would like to understand who are the people that I'm trying to associate my research with here. You know, who are the people deciding on whether you know, this should be included or not? One thing that I find super exciting is that um, if, if you follow this model, then essentially the journal is owned by those who produce the research, right? Or those who, who are token holders from the beginning. Uh, and there are various m ways to model that, obviously. But I think it's very powerful, because uh, then we get into the discussion of the price, right? If I subscribe to this journal, what is the price for that? And that's essentially then the community that decides on that. And, and of course, you have to factor in things like, okay, if we wanted to have a print journal, I don't know if someone still wants that, but you know, we have to have uh, someone who makes a nice, nice uh, looking PDF and things like that. So you know, if these people should be paid. Um, you can pay them uh, and you can set you know, the fees that you want to have for your uh, subscription. I think this is, for me, this is the most important part you own the journal that you are interested in, the research that you are interested in. I have said that already. I also said that the infrastructure cost can be deduced from, from for instance, the forfeited tokens from a challenge, right? You have all of this capital that is being, you know, uh, exchanged, the tokens, you can set um, the uh, amount of uh, fees that should be uh, are given to the network for certain things. Um, one thing that I like is the idea of, you know, how um, I see one problem when you say, okay, the default is that we let everyone on the list if there is no challenge, right? Well, you can think of a world in which no one actually reads the uh, articles. Uh, so one way to get around that is to say, well, if you own token and you are not participating in the review process, then, you know, with every time there's an application, your token value devaluates essentially. So that over time, if you are inactive, you, you lose your stake in that journal, which is also, you know, a fair representation of what's actually going on. You lost interest in reading all of that scholarship, right? So I think there are tools for us to make this really work. Lots of experiments needed. Also, differences in disciplines, right? I talked to mm, the, the uh, you know, my former grad student friends who are now professors in various disciplines, 
Like in musicology, everyone hated the idea. No, but we need to have our positions as editors, and you know, and 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 then economics people also they were like, mm, don't know if we need that. <coughs> so so best results I got from the sciences, you know. So I think there are differences between the um, disciplines that uh, you can you can essentially fine tune the token curated registry however you like. So again, take a look at the um, GitHub repository and the documentation there. I think it's, they are doing a really great job. I'm not a coder, so I'm not participating in the, in the coding. Okay, um, one thing, I have two minutes, one minute. <laughs> you, can, you can airdrop, for instance, in the beginning to, to create the group of, of uh, token. Um, okay, so this is it. Uh, questions, uh, comments, criticism, everything welcome. Yes, David, right? One yeah. question. <coughs> okay, uh, thank you for I haven't actually looked in detail at this issue yet. Um, but uh, my background is in evolutionary biology. Okay, so uh, when I look at that, you've missed out, to me, one huge thing. You know? If I was to sort of play this game, let's say at the last, last US election, I would definitely have backed Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Not because I agree with him, not because I think what he's saying is true, but because I would have thought other people would back him as well. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about here, just as an isolation here, is a shelling game mm -hmm. in which you're trying to predict what other people in the community will back and endorse on the list without any verifiable reference to truth. Mm -hmm. right? So um, that, in evolutionary terms, is a bird of paradise. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I might uh, remark that uh, like uh, Simon's work is very, very new yeah. and you have a bunch of mathematicians thinking uh, that the, you can solve uh, mankind's problem by putting everything I into a code, but uh, there is like, um, um, I think it's very young, TCRs, the idea of TCRs, it's uh, uh, token curated registries, it, it is a tool with which we can have uh, future reputation systems, but I, I, I fully agree that it probably needs a lot of evolving um, um, because uh, it's still too um, um, economic gains oriented um, and uh, the incentive systems have to be adapted to... Yeah, this is what needs to happen now. Uh, one remark. Uh, first of all, yes, that's true. It's a great remark. Um, the idea is that if you have a vote after a challenge, that you also you know, provide comments with it. And those will be published together with your real identity on the journal. <clears throat> and so, so if, you vote, if you vote for something that obviously you know, uh, doesn't have good quality, sooner or later it will, it will uh, you know, transpire. Uh, that doesn't solve the problem of uh, you know people doing like you know votes of, of tribes uh, to you know there are, associate. There are clear ways of solving. I mean, clear ways in science of solving those problems. Mm -hmm. That's a good starting point. That you need verifiable evidence feeding back incentives over the long term, mm -hmm. and that's what evolution does. It's well studied. There's good philosophy of knowledge in it. There's good evolutionary knowledge in it, and that by itself does not approach the problem. Maybe you can point me to some uh, resources. Thank you. Okay, maybe one last comment because... Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add to, to your comment because uh, I think that, yeah, stock information registry is definitely a good idea, but in terms to show blockchain community how it, in, uh, uh, crypto economy should be designed well. But, you know, I don't think it's, uh, the problem is just because stock information registries are too young. It's just because whole industry doesn't really know how to design crypto economy. And token crisis risk is just specific too. And it doesn't mean that it will solve all the problems. It's really uh, what I also been experiencing with eight years ago where distributed systems started to be right. And a lot of programmers were trying to put distributed system which were exactly designed for financial world into other, uh, other type of domains. And it will not work, but it or it it may, might work, but with much less efficiency if you design specifically to it. And token creation registries also might not work for all kinds of uh, cases. No, and you might not. Yeah, and, and you might try to tune it a lot of times mm -hmm. to achieve something. Yeah. But what? sometimes it's better to start from scratch. 
because uh, you know it's it's good design to, with with well well game theory economy, but I don't think that it's uh, uh, it, it might even don't feel completely one specific domain problem. You know because when you start from the technology, not from the business side, the main side, the uh, social economic process, you you shall start also always from this side and design the solution for you, not from design some technology in the vacuum. <coughs> abstract in yeah. Abstract, uh, well. I mean, my response to that would be that um, it is beneficial in a, in a general systematic way to develop building blocks that can be used uh, in more than one specific uh, context. And so I think token curated registries are more like, uh, if you say, crypto economic basic, basic building blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can be, they have to be actually tuned to different sorts of uh, yeah. scenarios. Yeah, I yeah, see totally. yeah, but I, I don't think that they will be called then you know this was the starting point this is really like Sherman said this whole discussion I think started in September of last year so it, it's still yeah, quite well, young. Maybe yes, even the, his work on attention tokens and curation markets is older but yes mm -hmm. the TCR itself um, is since, since September I think it's a good starting point for for solving the problem of reputation and um, um, and curation and this thing, but it's really just a starting point because sure. it's super raw. Uh, and as such, it can be an element for a lot of the solutions we're talking about these two days. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it's all very raw. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you guys. So and this input is it. So we have the last talk. Just before, uh, raise of hands, we made a reservation at Nike, which is a restaurant uh, just across. Uh, uh, we made a reservation inside where 20 people can sit. Uh, who would go to a joint uh, 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 restaurant? Okay, so I think we will give you some uh, instructions for later. If you order the things on the menu, uh, the food will come earlier. And then we can, uh, it's, they, have good, uh, they have good food. Um, yeah, so to the last talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Valentin. I work with Iris AI and I'm also a scientist, actually a physicist, uh, you're already a physicist by training. So from first hand experience, I can tell you well, science is in trouble, but oh boy, who am I talking to in here? Anyway, we, we've already had Ingo uh, nicely explain to us how the strange works, uh, strange system of science works. Anyway, here are some of the biggies that we think that would take science today. Where somehow at the heart of it all, um, or most of it, lies this gross misalignment of incentives that um, pressure scientists to publish as much as they can, which leads to reprodu reproducibility issues because they tend to oversell the results. We get into highly cited journals. This is really work. So we have built in biases based on um, impact factors. Um, also, of course, a huge information overload because people publish a lot and uh, people have huge troubles actually just keeping an overview of the field that is relevant to them. And of course, most of it is hidden behind paywalls. So we have access issues that people that originally paid for the research, I mean, taxpayers don't even have access to what they pay for. Um, we, so these are, these problems and some others actually cost me to uh, <coughs> Uh, many other young scientists do. And in my case, to join Iris AI, whose long-term goal is actually to go ahead and fix these issues. You know, like, uh, and what we do uh, at Iris AI is build smart AI-based um, science assistant tools for scientists to help them in the drudgery parts of everyday work. And the tools that we have so far um, already address the first two issues here, information overload, input biases, by helping scientists uh, with the research discovery and review phase. So don't really have much time to this. It will be a demo about our tools tomorrow. But um, imagine you're a scientist. You have a brilliant new idea of a new research project. First thing you want to do is, you know, you want to see, has this been done before? Has something similar been done before? Is it even possible? And if yes, what do I need to know to set out a mind demo? So um, what you would do with our tools is you'd actually start sitting down and writing up a problem statement in your own words, like you would explain it to your coworker, for example. 
And then in the first phase, our exploration tool would then bypass any weird keywords that you'd have to assemble in a jargon that you might not even know for Google Scholar and the likes. It will actually read your problem statement and extract the ideas and topics and concepts that are uh, in, in, in your problem statement. And it will find relevant research for you based on what's contained in the problem statement. It will present it to you in an easy navigat easily navigable 2D map that is pre-categorized in automatically discovered categories by the, uh, by the tool. So you get a, a fresh and broad overview of the problem space. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, what you want is a complete reading list, not which papers to actually have to read. So this is where the focus tool comes in handy. It enables you to very efficiently narrow down from a huge list of potentially relevant papers to an actual highly relevant reading list. And this you can do without having to read a single paper. And um, you can, using our tools, you can cut down the time that is required for such a systematic mapping, systematic mapping study uh, from uh, up to 90% from several weeks to a few days, actually. And, uh, and we've actually demonstrated that this works. So um, at the end of the day, you have your list of highly relevant papers you have. So I mean, this is all very great. And we're, uh, we're very successful with these tools. We've, uh, we've been named one of the top 10 innovative AI companies uh, worldwide in 2017 by Fast Company. We've raised over 2 million of uh, seed venture capital. We have uh, many high profile Gucci corporate and top more university clients. We have over 10,000 registered users of our free and premium tools and also AI trainers that help to improve our AI tools, which are based on a proven and peer reviewed technology that is also to a large part developed in house. So, yeah, that's all very great. Um, but as you remember, there are also these three things down here that we wanted to fix initially also. Um, but we at IRIS, we believe that these problems are kind of on a different level. So um, we think we can't and deliberately do not want to set out to fix them on our own. Much rather, we think this should be done in a community effort, um, namely in a grassroots movement of scientists, researchers, army departments, universities, uh, students, librarians, and uh, innovators alike. So we believe that a combination of AI and blockchain technology is the technological framework that is well suited uh, for this change. Um, but at the heart of it all it should be the community of scientists, the people that actually produce the science. So this is actually what we are proposing uh, with Project Ari that will launch in, in about a month or so. So the goal is to build a community, a decentralized community, around building an AI tool that we call the Knowledge Foundation Engine. And this is set out to kind of fix the reproducibility issues for, by sort of semi-automating the quality review. So it should assist a peer reviewer during the review process. But not only that, it has more applications. But this is how you can move the think of it. Um, so it would be a community effort to build this tool to help, in, help with um, validating knowledge. And what would come hand in hand with it is also a repository of already validated knowledge, which will be continually growing. And of course, it's also decentralized and open and accessible to everyone. And by introducing a new token also for this community, you can build new incentive models for rewarding people for things that have been doing for free up, up until now, like for example, peer reviewing papers. We've heard many times that this is, this is a serious issue. Um, but what I would like to think this token about is actually it's kind of a, it's literally a token of appreciation of the community for active community participation. So you are incentivized to go ahead and actively participate in the community. Now this is a thing, if you're a scientist, you want this thing to happen, you want science to change, you should actively participate in your community and this is, this is the incentive model that gives you actually also the reward for your contributions. So why, why do we need blockchain and why do we need a to new token for this? Well, of course, I mean, this is what it's all about. We want this thing to be, we want the, the tool for, for validated knowledge and the connected repository of validated knowledge to be not a property of a few, um, of few entities that control, or, uh, that control this, but this should be the property of the entire community or essentially human kind. So, of course, all members own it. Um, the, 
one of one of the uh, one of the defining features of, of blockchain is that uh, of uh, of anonymity. So every community member is basically on, on equal on equal footing. So every member has equal opportunity, but at the same time also faces equal scrutiny. So contributions by members should not be should purely be judged on the quality of the contributions and not by their name or their reputation. And of course, by introducing a new token, um, you could now start and design a new economic model uh, from scratch um, through smart contracts and an automated central um, institution that will take action to actually balance the values of these different contributions that you can put into the community and services that you can take out of the community based on supply and demand. So this would be kind of a self-controlling um, process, but still with this institution taking measures such that everything is balanced also against the outside. Um, so how can you now earn or spend tokens? I mean, there are several ways that you envision how you can earn and spend tokens. For example, you could you could be an AI trainer and annotate data sets for the AI tools. You could directly contribute code to the knowledge validation engine. You could find and track and fix bugs, quality assurance. Or as a researcher, you could directly publish your research straight into our validated repository. Um, and also peer review other people's contribution, where the knowledge validation engine will be a great help of assistance to you. And it will also help in further building and improving the knowledge validation engine. On the other hand, you can spend tokens, for example, by directly tapping into the IR engine. So you can take a document, just have it validated, and see what's, what, what's in it. Um, I will explain this later. Um, you can also, if you're an external company, you can view this project actually as a community-run open source project. And you can just go ahead and build third-party applications on top of it, where you would gain access to the engine by paying for API calls. So, I mean, it is basically open access, but you would pay a small fee for making use of it. Um, and connected with this, you could then also use these tokens to directly pay for services that these third-party services would supply for you, which is actually also what, uh, how it will work with, with our current and future premium tools at IRIS, so you can use these tokens to pay for our services actually to a much discounted price as compared to if you have a conventional subscription. So the things that I've marked in green here are the ones that we envision to be the most imminent to be implemented once this community, of, uh, community is, is up and running. So the central goal of the community should be to, uh, to build this uh, knowledge validation engine, which is an AI tool that can be loosely thought of uh, semi-automating or assisting in the peer review process. And the input would be a scientific document and the engine would then extract the contained hypothesis and arguments, will kind of link them against each other and validate them against all existing knowledge. So it would kind of build a truth tree of the document <coughs> and see what underlying assumptions or restrictions are not visible, I guess. <laughs> right, here we go. So this is something like the, uh, the argument map that David uh, mentioned earlier. So this is something that the envision. Um, so in each of these underlying assumptions would be validated or it would be, see, it would be shown or it would get a score how much this assumption or how much it relies on this assumption or how much you can trust the hypothesis contained in this paper and if there are any inconsistencies between arguments and the last. So of course, I mean, this is kind of a, you have to go into more detail. And of course, it's a very big uh, project, but it's actually more realistic than you would think from, a, from an AI standpoint. And um, the timeline that we envision, I mean, of course we envision for this, would be to build this in about four years in a community effort, of course subject to several milestones of, of, of service releases. Uh, and finally, the repository that would go, that go hand in hand with it is, of <coughs> course, like many of you also suggested this, I mean, we definitely have to not only publish, you know, polished, oversold, positive results, there needs to be space for failed results or for reproducing science. I mean, it doesn't make sense if we keep on making the same mistakes over and over again because, you know, the guy next door doesn't tell you that it doesn't work. So we also, we also, um, we embrace parallel pub publishing. We do not care if you, if you put your paper on our repository. We don't care where else you put it. You can put it anywhere. 
if you put it in our repository, it means it has the added value of, uh, of, the, of the knowledge validation engine. And what I forgot to mention actually here is, um, what, what I get asked quite a few times is, it doesn't output a yes or no answer. It's not like it's validated or it's not validated. It's sort of like a, you get a, an automated report, much like an, an assist, well, an assistant automatic uh, report about the, about the document with several scores, and you can use it as help for a manual review process. So it's not a black and white thing. It has many gray shades in between and many dimensions. So um, it will be, of course, open access, decentralized, access to everyone. It will be peer reviewed. It also features ongoing review, which means once, like as Dean said, if it doesn't make sense that you review a paper once and then it's set in stone and you can't change anything anymore, you can at any time go ahead and challenge a review of your paper. Or you could write up a follow-up paper to show that some other paper is actually wrong. And this would be in, in, uh, in interaction, of course. And it would be very nice to actually talk about this and see if we can make some integrations. Of course, it's, it's integrated and has natural collaborations through third-party um, tools that can be built on top of this other uh, higher engine. So, on top of the technological capabilities that the blockchain offers, of course, as we've also heard today, there's a lot of possibilities for new decentralized governance structures. And at this point, I want to mention that we as IRIS we, are the, we want to be the initiator of this community. We do not want to own this community. So you can think of us as something like a service contractor or a lead developer for a certain initial phase to get the community up and running. But after it's running for about, we well, envision about 18 months or so, we will actually step back and become one of the general members of the community. So we'll burn or give away all our tokens that should fall below 1% ownership cap that we uh, will introduce such that no single member can, be, can, uh, can become all powerful. Um, and it would be interesting to talk about this. <laughs> um, we, will have a, we will have a token sale late in May and early June, um, where 75% of the raised fund will directly go into the community in form of escrow, which will be re released upon reaching certain milestones on the roadmap. And of course, we also, all decisions that have to be taken in the community, let's say about the roadmap, or about uh, questionable contributions, or about challenges or something, all of these will be decentralized and democratized. So it will be community decisions that every member can participate in based on the voting power, which is based on the contributions, how active they are in the community, like the contributions they have added to the community. Also, yes, there are token stakes and also how long they've been part, an active part of the community. So... Like three more slides, right? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Yep. So can you make a quick buck with this? Um, well, actually, with, with this clear-cut proof of human work, it's actually a perfect example of a functional token, par excellence, and it is therefore far from, a, from an instrument of short-term financial speculation. It's much rather meant for natural holders that really believe in the added value of this project to themselves or to humanity. So, having said that, it is very well possible in their potential for the token to indirectly uh, grow in value since the services that you will get for the token will increase in quality over time and you, are, you yourself as a member will be incentivized to add to the quality of these tools because this will add to the value of the token. So the technology will improve, the repository will naturally grow, and also through third-party tools that other companies will adopt, there will be external corporate money funneled into the ecosystem. So to wrap it all up, I mean, why can or should we do it that way as a company? Well, for our roadmap, we need the knowledge validation engine. We think we can't build it alone, and we don't want to build it alone. So, this is why we're releasing this to the community. But at the same time, we will be, at least in the first phase, a main contributor to, uh, to, this, to this engine. So we will we'll get um, steady revenues for the community because we're contributing, at least as long as the community thinks that our contributions are useful. Um, and even if there were some other companies that would say, okay, well, that's pretty 
cool, let's use this engine and build something similar to Iris, um, we would have the first mover advantage. So we have been thinking about these things, or actually the co-founders have, uh, for many, many years, and they, we know exactly where we want to go with this, so we will have the first mover advantage. But most importantly, I mean, if you remember, we wanted to fix these five problems, so, and many more, so it's, it's most importantly about impact and, you know, making science a healthy and um, fun and open environment again. And we want to do this in a community effort together. So let's science the shit out of this together. Thank you. We do, we do two questions, okay? Then All right. Quick questions before the last question. Yeah. 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 Comment. Uh, Comment, yeah. Thank you for this very nice talk. Um, I would like to say that I don't see the ongoing peer review working because you hardly find two or three peer reviews to review your work and you cannot incentivize a hundred of peer reviews. How, how would you incentivize it? Well, here you, you get tokens for it. Here you get tokens for it. But the thing is, it's a functional token that you yourself can then again spend in the community to have your work reviewed or validated. This, we can continue two more with this discussion, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, like, one more, you mm -hmm. pick, like... Thank you for the very interesting talk. When you look at the uh, discussion in the last 10, 15 years around uh, computable research, you have this impression that, okay, set aside humanities for a moment, yes? But for science and technologies, the research is really, really a bad container to package knowledge. And you, with your approach, acknowledge this in a way, yes. What you offer is, okay, we take those nasty papers and break down what is actually in them. Exactly. And now my question is, is this really the sustainable, best service that you can deliver with your artificial intelligence background to the community? Because if, if, if you would somehow incentivize and help researchers to uh, come up with uh, structured knowledge from the get-go, why they, why they are producing this, this would be much more worthwhile because we wouldn't uh, come up with all these crowded papers, but instead, instead have uh, nice nano-publications, clear structured statements within uh, a paper, whatever. And one additional, little, additional question. Uh, if you have a look at AI research, there's a lot uh, of going on with this uh, branch of uh, explainability of uh, what a, a neural uh, network comes up with. And in this area, this would be clearly a mark of openness and open values to have this in place so that I have this uh, added value from the machine, but somehow it is also explained to me how that neural network came up with that job. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that we should not only consider the scientific paper as the only contribution you can make as a scientist.